In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we have before us in Matthew's Gospel what has been called the Magna Carta of Citizenship in the Kingdom of God. I like to think of it as the Bill of Rights and the Bill of Responsibilities for Citizenship in the Kingdom of God. Earlier in Matthew's Gospel, it's all been about what the Kingdom of God is like and joining the Kingdom, becoming citizens of the Kingdom. Now, in these, in these pages of the Gospel, what does it mean what, what, what to be a citizen of God's Kingdom? Because before we're the citizens of any place else, we're the citizens of the kingdom of God. And so we have before us the themes this morning of judgment, forgiveness, and recon reconciliation. I commend to you the passage from Romans because it helps us reflect on life in the early community, in the early church. We often have this overly idealized idea of what life in the early community was like, how perfect it must have been, how everybody, you know, remembered either Jesus himself or those who knew Jesus himself, and how they walked about singing whatever the Hebrew version of Kumbaya was, and, and just somehow or other, we have to get back to this idyllic time. Eh, not true. We hear this morning, but by the way, you don't make a rule or you don't admonish somebody to a certain kind of behavior unless the behavior has been problematic. If you have a babysitter coming over to watch your seven-year-old and your three-year-old, and you say to the babysitter, don't let the seven-year-old feed spider webs to the three-year-old. That isn't just something you sat up last night and thought about that it could possibly happen at some day in the universe. If you mention it, it probably has happened. I once gave a retreat uh, down in Kentucky and uh, to an Episcopal parish, and we were staying in a a retreat house run by a group of Roman Catholic nuns. And they handed out, you know, the rules of the house. The door is locked at 11 o'clock. You know, uh, please don't bring food to the rooms. You know, there, were, there are a list of rules. Um, you know, not oppressive. But I was struck by rule number 14. Rule number 14 was, please leave all loaded firearms locked in your cars. And I thought to myself, you know, those elderly sisters weren't just sitting around the table one night trying to make up rules for the house. And right after they thought, you know what, if people shouldn't bring crumb cake to the rules, it'll bring to the rooms, it'll bring bugs. They 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 didn't then automatically think, should we have a rule about firearms? No. Some jackass brought a loaded gun into the house at some point, and they decided they needed to remind people that that was a really bad idea. Okay, so, so in the Romans reading, apparently there were conflicts in the early community to which Paul is writing about people who had certain dietary restrictions, lots of those in Judaism, okay, um, and those who thought, eh, you know, eating anything was okay. Um, meat was often offered to local gods in the markets, and so we see this in other places in the New Testament. Do we eat the meat? Do we not eat the meat? Blah, blah, blah. There are also apparently conflicts over the keeping of holy days or special festivals. Okay. And by the way, that continued right down to the Reformation. One of the conditions for the restoration of the Anglican Church after the Puritan revolt was the king had to promise to bring back the 12 days of Christmas because the Puritans had suppressed Christmas celebrations basically because it was 12 days of New Year's Eve of drunken debauchery. So they had a point, but 
Some people celebrate special days, some people don't. And what, and what, what the author of Romans is saying to the church is, for God's sake, calm down. If you want to only eat vegetables because that helps you to honor God, do that. And if you don't, don't. But stop being crazy about, you know, judging people who do something differently from the way that you do it. As long as they're doing it for the honor of God and assume that they are because that's what you're doing. Okay? Be very careful about making judgments. Be very careful about making judgments. Why? Because we're all very narcissistic and we all tend to be the center of our own dramas and we all tend to see our own points of view as being obviously the only correct and right ones and everybody else is evil and from the devil and doing things from terrible motivations. I don't know about you, but I struggle with that within myself every bloody day of my life and I have for as long as I have conscious memories. I assume most of you are better human beings than I am, and you've probably gone a long way towards using God's grace to cure yourselves of that. But the church holds us up to that today. And so Peter, speaking for all of us, goes to Jesus and probably thinking, what a great boy am I? You know, if somebody in, you know, somebody sins against me, um, you know, what, how many times should I forgive? Now, the rabbis taught you should forgive three times. The basic principle was somebody does something once, yeah, it's an accident. Twice could be a coincidence. Three times, it's a pattern. You're responsible for it. Cut it out. And so when he says, should I forgive seven times, he thinks Jesus is going to praise him for being so over the top and generous about the notion of forgiveness. And what does Jesus do? He quotes a number and he doesn't mean 400 and whatever the math is. You guys can do that. What he does is he quotes a number that's over the top, a number that isn't a number that you count. Okay. And the same is true in the parable that follows. You know, the first slave, he owes, you know, what would be millions of dollars today, an unpayable debt. Okay. An incalculable debt that, that, that somebody in his position would not be able to pay in five lifetimes, okay? That's the debt that's forgiven, okay? So, so we're admonished to forgive one another endlessly, endlessly forgive, to have no limit to our forgiveness. Now, I warn you that forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But think in English, the word, what, forgive. We talk about to forbear, okay, to foreshadow, to foretell. Foreshadow means to hint at, to, to foretell means to tell before you tell. To forgive means what? It means to go back to the relationship the way it was before the offense took place. Both practically and behaviorally, but we're told later on, but also in our hearts. To forgive from our hearts, not just some sort of external, perfunctory, oh yeah, I forgive you, you know, and yet, don't we all love, and, and maybe I should just speak for myself, okay? Often we go through the world collecting grudges, collecting slights, and we put them away in a little box or in the top drawer, and we hold them as if they were precious heirlooms, right? Oh, you offended me then, and you hurt me then, and you did that other thing then. Oh, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna hold this away. I'm gonna hold this, and I'm gonna rub your nose in it the next time you tick me off the next time you irritate me the next time you do something i'm going to say see you've always been like this it, it, it seems to be part of the way god made us i don't understand why but to forgive means 
Well, when you forgive a debt, that's, that's the image that's used today. It means it's as if the debt never existed. If the debt is forgiven, it's gone. And not only is it gone, it's like it never was. Okay, it's like you didn't owe me anything. I decide to go back to what it was before the loan was made. And what our Lord asks us to do is deep within ourselves to pray for the grace and to engage in the practices that will allow us to go back to the relationship the way it was before the debt was owed. Why? Because that's what God does with us. In a certain way, by human standards, God is a chump. If we just beg God's forgiveness and we're not fooling around about it, God goes, okay. And he always goes, okay, you're forgiven. Okay, you're forgiven. I get it. Why? Because you asked me to forgive you. Because in a certain sense, God was a fool to loan that first slave all that money. Why? Because he, unless God was an idiot, God would know that it couldn't possibly be repaid. What return can we give to the Lord for all that he has given us? The gift of life and living and love. How can we ever repay that? We can't. It's not even possible to repay that. And so what our Lord is asking us to do in the context of our parish of our church, of our world, in the communities in which we live, to practice the same kind of forbearance and forgiveness that God offers to us every morning when we put our feet on the ground as we get out of bed. Every time we turn back to God, having done something wrong or evil or stupid or foolish, I'm so sorry, forgive me. And we say, I won't do it again. And we mean it when we say it, don't we? We really mean it. And then most of the time we go back and just do it again. Okay? It's one of the things I find most frustrating these days when I spend a lot of time sitting on my sun porch, you know, listening to my toenails grow and, and thinking about my life and the quality of my life. How many times have I promised God I won't do that anymore or I will start doing this every day? And how many times has that just not been the case? It's a number I can't count. And again, I assume most of you are better human beings than I'll ever be. But that's the way it is with me. And to the degree that it's that way with you, we have to pray for the grace to be able to more and more and more profoundly forgive one another as God forgives us. That's why. We are all the beneficiaries of God's endless generosity simply because we exist, okay? If God stopped thinking about you or me, we would evaporate. We would no longer exist. We would no longer have life and breath. And then there's the matter of reconciliation. We're taught in last week's gospel to seek reconciliation. Someone sins against you, we're supposed to go to them privately and try and work it out. Now, anybody who's ever actually tried to do that in the real universe knows that that's not as easy as it sounds. Okay, you tell anybody that they've done something wrong or that they've hurt you, and the usual reaction is, I didn't, no, I didn't, and you misunderstood, and that's not what really happened, and blah, 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 blah. Okay. But we're told, we're commanded, when it's not just a suggestion, that it's our responsibility to go to the ones who hurt us or harm us and seek reconciliation in Christ's name. And that there's a whole process to go through. Bring others, whatever, that, that's from last week. But now... Here's the thing about reconciliation. Forgiveness is a table for one. I can forgive someone. I can pray for the grace to forgive them. I can pray for the grace to try and relate to them as if the offense never happened, regardless of whether they agree that they've offended me and they've, they've been penitent. My forgiveness should elicit their penitence. 
not the other way around. Not penitence comes first, at least not as Jesus teaches it, but rather forgiveness elicits penitence. Now, penitence is important, but here's the thing. We don't hear it in the parable, but I'm more than willing to bet that the, that the rich guy did not loan that slave another million dollars the next week. And that way, I don't think God is a chump, okay? We have no right and no willingness or should have no willingness to allow people to harm us, okay? For a woman whose husband abuses her to try and reconcile with that person, if he is not going to stop beating her up, that's not grace, that's stupidity. You can only, re reconciliation is a table for two, and it requires real penitence and real amendment on the part of the other person, okay? To keep putting oneself in a position where one is being hurt or abused or stolen from, that's not a matter of grace. Sometimes forgiveness can only be maintained when we keep our distance and don't allow the other person to hurt us again. And that's important for the life of the community. Now, we can't do any of this on our own. We need God's grace to be able to do it. We're human, we're frail, we're weak. We tend to see things from our own point of view. What we're really hearing today when we hear about forgiveness is a more extended version or a parable about what we say every day when we say the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you say morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, and Compline, you say that prayer at least four times a day. And if you don't say those four long prayer forms, you should say the Lord's Prayer at least four times a day. We're supposed to say those words and mean them. For many years, I wondered about the parable, why the, the king was so angry. All the king did was adapt the attitude that the unrepentant slave adapted. He judged him by the standards that he judged the other. We ask God to do that with us every time we say the Lord's Prayer. There's no end to God's mercy. There is absolutely no end to God's mercy. There can't be. Because he says so. But God limits his mercy in some ways that I don't pretend to understand by our willingness to be merciful. We ask God to be judged not according to his mercy, but according to the same standards that we judge. We're asking God to limit himself. And we do that as a way of asking God's grace to expand our hearts so that our hearts can grow and grow and grow and grow until ultimately, usually the other side of the grave, our hearts are as large as God's heart and they can encompass everyone at all times and in all places. So, the Bill of Rights and the Bill of Responsibilities in the Constitution of the Kingdom of God is the practice of forgiveness, whenever possible, reconciliation, and of as little judgment as possible and only judgment by God's standards. And submitting to God's merciful judgment so that we too can receive God's merciful judgment and we can be ministers of that merciful judgment to those around us inside the community first and then to those outside the community. I was so moved recently to watch the, 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 the clip on television. Okay. 
many years ago. A man almost beaten to death by the Ku Klux Klan. And one of those Klansmen coming to his office in the House of Representatives and saying, I'm one of the men who tried to kill you. Please, can you forgive me? And that wonderful man standing up and coming around the desk and saying, of course I forgive you. Of course I forgive you. I am not that man yet, not even close. But that's the kind of man I want to be. And I pray this morning that that's the kind of man and the kind of woman that you want to be. Let God's people say, Amen.